Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Welcome to our event, on a conversation with Chairman Jody Arrington, the potential implications of a fiscal commission. Uh, my name is Stan Foyga. I'm a senior fellow here at AI. I'm delighted to host this event on the need for and potential implications, as I said, of a fiscal commission. Uh, good afternoon as well to our online viewership. For our online viewers, please submit your questions to jack.rowing at AEI.org or via Twitter with hashtag AskAEIEcon. Um, those uh, questions that you'll be submitting online will uh, appear on an iPad that I think will magically appear near me in the near future so I can read them out. Uh, so today's event will consist of two parts. First, we'll have a panel discussion featuring Louis Shiner, the Robert S. Kerr Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, my colleague, my AI colleague, Mark Wachowski. Uh, I'll be moderating this conversation. Um, Louisa and Mark are gonna deliver brief opening comments, then we'll have a conversation, we'll take some audience questions. Uh, after that, the three of us will disappear, uh, and instead, uh, my colleague, Jim Capretta, will welcome Congressman Jody Arrington, who represents Texas's uh, 19th Congressional District uh, and chairs the House Budget Committee. With that introduction, let's get started here. Uh, Mark, do you want to kick off our, our discussion? Sure. I believe uh, you have some slides that are going to I, appear. I do have some slides. And um, uh, let me just start by saying that uh, recently, uh, very recently over the, week, over the weekend, uh, Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve Board was quoted as saying that fiscal policy in the United States is not sustainable. Um, and I, I agree. And so what I'm gonna do is just very briefly in the, in the next few minutes of, with these slides is to sort of show some recent trends, projections, and uh, to focus on the role of healthcare spending in those trends and projections. And, um, and then maybe just very quickly uh, uh, sort of give the implications of how a fiscal commission might be set up to sort of uh, deal, with, deal with this issue. So uh, the very first slide is a uh, thing uh, that I think many people have seen is the percent of uh, uh, federal debt outstanding as a percent of GDP. Uh, for many years, uh, you know, after the Second World War, as, it, as that percent came down, uh, it was always in the, in the 30 to 40% range, and that continued uh, through the Great Recession. But then um, it, in the Great Recession, it, 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 it increased substantially to 60%. In, in the last decade, it was increasing, um, but then we got a real gigantic increase uh, because of the pandemic, and now we're at about 100%. So that's a very large number. Um, it's not per se unsustainable, but it is, um, I think, a big part of why, for example, we're no longer AAA, where, uh, where our credit rating was cut, and, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and, and, the, and conditions are, are not favorable to, to keep it even at that level. So uh, the next slide is to show federal spending and revenue since 1990. Um, and I have a couple of air averages um, looking, and this is the deficit, obviously, the difference between uh, uh, revenue and spending, the negative is, is a deficit. Um, in the beginning of the half uh, from 1990 to 2007, uh, spending averaged about 19.5% of GDP, and revenues was about 18%, a little less than 18%. Um, looking at the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years, uh, spending has really uh, ballooned uh, by about uh, three and three and a half percentage points, and revenue has come down by about percentage points. So the deficit, obviously, uh, looking at these these numbers, which you know you try to uh, you know uh, the point of averages is to uh, to uh, average out uh, recessions and booms. Uh, stock market booms and, and recessions. But clearly the trends here are bad uh, they, with uh, increasing deficit uh, in both directions, both in terms of much much higher spending and, and somewhat lower revenues. Um, another way of, of measuring this is to pick two years and sort of see what, what the causes are. Um, and, and so I pick 1996 and the last year, 2023. I chose 96 both because that was a year that was uh, a good year in the terms of the economy, uh, but the deficit was actually pretty modest. It was about 2%. Uh, and we haven't been that low for, for, for some time. And again, it's pretty much the same story, that most of it is due to increased spending, but there's also a decline in revenues. So it's in both directions. Um, the biggest increase in spending is on healthcare. Um, um, uh, more than half of the increase in spending is on healthcare, and that's because of particular programs, the Medicare uh, drug program, the ACA, 
um, a, lot of, a lot of different uh, veterans, uh, health care, Medicaid, uh, on and on. Uh, it's certainly so Social Security is part of it because of the aging of, of, the, of our society, but it's, it's mainly a health care story. So another way of looking at this is looking at national health care expenditures and, and, who, uh, and what, uh, you know, what the, the sources of, of, of payment are. So number one is we see the increase in health care spending as a share of GDP, over, again, over the same period of time. And we see the federal government uh, taking a much larger role than it had been uh, at the beginning. And um, that, that is certainly the big part of the, the spending increase. Um, which we have not covered by, by revenue increases. So um, that's history. Uh, what about projections, which is really what, what we uh, are most concerned about um, in terms of whether this is sustainable. And so I, I reproduced the CBO's projections and we have a model. Uh, uh, I and my colleagues have produced a model similar to the CBO model. Um, and uh, the CBO certainly indicates that in the next 30 years, debt as a share of GDP will be uh, increasing very rapidly. Uh, the deficit will be increasing as well, and interest spending will also be increasing. All, all elements of, of an unsustainable uh, situation. Uh, in our model, uh, again, which, which has a lot of similarities to what CBO does, we, we see it much worse. Um, we see a bigger increase in debt, bigger increase in deficit, and ultimately a bigger increase in interest spending. And the reason for those differences is, number one, is we're modeling current policy, not current law. CBO models current law as they're required to do, but, um, but that's not a realistic projection. Um, the other thing is we have an endogenous healthcare sector, um, in particular as uh, the labor shortages uh, increase because of the aging of, of the population, that particularly increases the healthcare costs. And we think that they're gonna go up more than what the CBO projects. And the other uh, big factor, of course, is the interest rate. So we use a real interest rate, uh, base rate of 1.8%, uh, which is about what it is currently. Like, if you look at uh, today's uh, Treasury tips rate, is about 2 percentage points, 2%. Uh, but we see that increasing uh, because uh, as the deficit increases, um, uh, interest rates increase. That's, that's a well-established economic relationship. We actually are more conservative even than the CBO in this regard, but we still see that that, that relationship uh, 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 occurs. So in, in, in short, we have a, a serious problem. And um, just, in, just very briefly in terms of what the implications of that for a fiscal commission are, is that um, you know, they, in the legislation, they, they're targeting 100% of GDP uh, for, for debt. I, I, unfortunately, I think we're, we're beyond that already. So I, I think even a, a conservative, ambitious targeting will have to be higher than that. I think we need to focus on the deficit as well, um, not just the debt outstanding. And then finally, I think in terms of particular solutions, we really do need to focus on health care um, and to become very creative. We've tried a lot and it has not worked in terms of controlling costs and controlling expenditures in that area. But the uh, Fiscal Commission will need to devote a lot of effort in that area because that's where the, uh, the spending problem is. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Louise, how worried should we be about the debt? Yeah, that's the question. So um, can I have a yeah. thank you so much? Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. So yeah, I agree that our fiscal situation is unsustainable. At some point, we will have to do something. But that doesn't really put any kind of marker on like, well, is this a huge problem? Is it a small problem? Is it something we have to do something immediately about? So I just want to talk a little bit about that. So why do we worry about the debt in the first place? So there's really two broad reasons. One, the sort of traditional, we borrow now, we consume now, our children are worse off. It makes us poor. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And the other one is not so much as just sort of a pure standard model, but somehow it raises the probability of some kind of crisis. I think people think of Greece, that all of a sudden we're not going to be able to borrow and we'll be in crisis. So I think those are two quite different things to, to worry about. So let's go talking about assuming no fiscal crisis, what are the costs of debt? So you can think about them from two perspectives. They are really two sides of the same coin. Um, one, you can think about it from sort of a, just a budget perspective. So we're going to borrow. We're going to have higher debt. Future taxpayers are going to have to make interest payments on that debt, which makes them poorer. Either they'll have to have 
less government spending or higher taxes in order for these interest payments to be made. How much interest do they have to pay? Well, they don't actually have to pay all the interest on the debt. They don't have to pay the interest rates times the debt. To keep debt sustainable, what we used to think of as sustainability is to get to a situation where your debt to GDP ratio stops rising, right? So it's going 100, 120, 150. At some point you say no more, we're gonna keep it at this level. To keep it at that level, you need to make payments equal to the interest rates less the growth rate of GDP times the debt. As your GDP rises, your debt can rise without pushing up the, the debt to GDP ratio. So you only have to do this I minus G. You might have heard about this huge debate of R minus G or I minus G. It's all about this. When you think about the sort of dynamics of debt, that's a really key parameter. Um, you can think about it from the macro perspective, which is that, forget about taxes or taxpayers, but that if we raise consumption today, if we borrow and, and, and consume today, then that's gonna be lowering our investment, right? If we're gonna be a full employment economy, if consumption goes up, investment's gonna go down, that will lower our capital stock, or in an open economy, we are gonna basically end up borrowing from abroad. Um, and they will own more of our economy. And so that makes us poor in the future as well. We either have less capital and we have less GDP or more of our capital is owned by foreigners. Um, and so either way, that's really the cost of debt. That's really important when you think about what is the debt financing? Because debt that is doing something that actually increases future growth enough does not make us poorer. So if you have a, an investment could be public education, it could be giving money to poor families, it could be resilience against climate change. That means that your GDP is more than the interest rate higher in the future, and so you have enough to pay off the debt from your investment, then you don't worry about it. So it's really important to think about what is it that we are borrowing for um, when we think about these intergenerational issues. Um, so let's just look, put some numbers on this cost of allowing the debt to mount. So one way to think about this question is, we, could, we can wait five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years before we act, right? Let's say we waited until the end of CBO's projection in June of, uh, in 2053 to say, okay, that's it. We're at 181% of GDP. That's as high as we wanna go. We're gonna have to make some changes. And what are those changes? Well, the debt that, the interest on the debt that would have to service that I minus G at that point is shown in that graph. So you can see it's very low now, it's actually negative, it's rising, but it hits like a half a percent of GDP by 2053. So that means at CBO's assumed interest rates, I'll talk about those in a second, and a CBO's projected growth rate of the economy, even doing nothing till 2053 is is gonna mean that our interest payments are a half percent of GDP, uh, not even a half percent more, just a half percent of GDP. Um, and so um, it's hard to worry too, too much about that. We're gonna be much richer in the future if we have like a half percent of GDP more when our GDPs are gonna be like 50% more. It doesn't seem like a huge deal. Um, of course, to keep the debt to GDP constant, we'd have to eliminate the primary deficit, would be 3.3% of GDP. So a combination of higher taxes and lower spending equal to 3.7% of GDP. If we do nothing until 2050, 2053, would then stabilize the debt at that level. Um, so what about the recent rise in interest rates? So that's something that, um, as Mark mentioned, rates have gone up a lot. They were like a half a percent on average. Real rates on the 10, so I'm looking at the real rate on the 10-year treasury, so 10-year tips, um, 2014 to 2019. They were 1.8% last night when I wrote it. <laughs> They're closer so to two today. today. <laughs> and that's because of Powell's 60-minute speech. And that is actually important um, because- well, They keep going up at, at this rate. <laughs> well, but they, no, 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 no. They were up quite a bit. They've come down over the last month, right? So they went way up. They've come down. Um, so does this mean that that, that that outlook is much worse? Maybe, but not necessarily. Why? Some of this race stuff is clearly about the Fed. Um, yeah, as, as we can see from last night, Powell says we're not, we're, we're, it's going to be mid-year instead of March and like 10-year rates move up to 10. It's like crazy, but it's very responsive um, to what the Fed does. So once we're over this inflation fighting cycle and this easing cycle, rates may go back down to the levels that we saw before. The other thing is CBO has already anticipated that real rates would rise over time. They never thought they were going to stay at these half percent levels that we saw from 2014 to 2019. So in their June 2023 projection, uh, they had a 1.6% rate in 2025. So it's higher now, but it's not that much higher. Um, and even at a 2% rate, GDP growth is going to be something like 1.8%. 2%, 1.7%, something in that order. So like R minus G is still not all that big. Um, the 
other thing is it's possible that rates are higher. And one of the reasons people think that maybe the Fed isn't going to cut that much is because so-called R star is higher, which is kind of the rate that the Fed would set when the economy is at full employment. And so if we, but that means that GDP growth is stronger and GDP is more resilient. So that might say, yes, I'm going to raise my future estimate of GDP, uh, of interest rates, but at the same time, I'm going to raise my estimate of future GDP growth. So on that I minus G thing, that's a wash, but higher GDP growth actually also lowers primary deficits. And so to the extent we have higher interest rates, but higher economic growth, and, and maybe it's because of AI, um, then that's actually a very good thing for the fiscal outlook. Um, but if the recent rise is in interest is just the beginning, right? Maybe it doesn't stop it too. Maybe it's going to go up a lot, and it's not because of higher productivity. Yeah, you'd start worrying more. Um, okay, I think the oops. So I should have checked it. It's cut off. Um, so this top of the slide should say, "What about a fiscal crisis?" That I mentioned. And I said, "I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to think about it." So let's talk about what a fiscal crisis is. People talk about it all the time without really defining it. I think it's some event that makes investors not want to lend to the U.S or only want to, let, to lend to them at much higher interest rates that other countries can borrow at, or somehow forces the US to raise taxes and cut spending very sharply and cause a, a deep recession. That's what I'm worried about. Um, the most plausible scenario in which such a crisis occurs isn't really an economic scenario, it's a political one. Congress doesn't lift the debt ceiling. They enact these huge tax cuts, making the fiscal situation much, much worse. They decide not to pay interest to foreign treasury holders for some reason, it's a political thing. You know, the cost of chaos like that over the long run is hard to know. You know, does something happen and then they resolve it really quickly because they see it's chaos, like happens all the time with the debt ceiling? Um, or is this something that really has long-lasting effects on our outlook? I don't know. And it's also not clear whether or not the ch chances of that happening, our third debt is 100% of GDP or 130% of GDP is all that different. Um, uh, and finally, a fiscal crisis that's really, we, we simply can't, we borrow so much, we simply can't pay it back. We just have to declare bankruptcy. That seems pretty implausible. Um, our total tax bill is, is about 8% less as a share of GDP than the OECD average. Nothing that we're projecting would, would say that even if we raise our, our taxes to that level or, and we cut spending too, we wouldn't be able to service our debt in any, any reasonable horizon. So, thanks. Thanks, Lise. Uh, uh, so, Mark, uh, if, if, if our much richer future descendants can easily service the debt and we don't have to worry about a fiscal crisis, why are you concerned? Well, I, I mean, basically, I disagree on both points. Uh, number one is, I mean, the, the whole discussion about the relationship between interest rates and, and, and growth, you know, which is higher or lower, you know, is an interesting one, but it's largely academic because, in, in fact, our primary deficits are large and they're increasing. Um, mainly because of the aging of the population, also because of healthcare costs going up. So, I mean, we have, you know, we, we have this, this scenario of, uh, you know, we don't have a crisis because uh, interest rates are, are lower than, than economic growth. But we, what you're sort of missing is uh, the primary deficit, the fact that our, our, we're spending much more than we're collecting. So that's number one. Uh, that, that's on the, on, on the, uh, on the you know, uh, uh, on one, one aspect of it. The other is, is the fiscal crisis. Um, I think there are a lot, of, a lot more scenarios where there could be a fiscal crisis. And one which I think is, is, is possible is, um, you know, as interest payments uh, on the debt uh, increase, and they are, have increased and they're going to continue to increase both by our projection and the CBO projection, um, I, I think you do have a significant inflation risk. And you know the 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 thing the thought that the Fed will will intervene you know really does depend on their political ability to do so. But when you're in this mode of the, all these interest payments are crowding out you know necessary services, I think it's going to be politically difficult to 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 deal with that. That's the most likely uh, manifestation of a fiscal crisis in the United States. I think, Louise, I know you'll you'll want to respond to the first point. I think. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. So. What I showed you in terms of like the R minus G and those that sustainable debt spending is assumes that we run these huge primary deficits from now through 2050. So it's not forgetting about them. It's saying, yeah, we're going to be running a primary deficit. We're going to keep on increasing to our debt and keep on increasing to our debt. The interest rates are going to rise because of that and put it all together. How much is that actually going to cost us? Not that much, so right? I, I mean, can I ask you something yeah. like that? Because so some of these projections have debt in 2050 at 200, 300 percent of GDP, right? At a 1.5 percent. 
uh, interest rate, you're, you're saying what you should look at is 1.5 minus, minus real growth until you get a half a percent of 200, <laughs> which is about 1% of yeah. GDP. Yeah. Right? So that's the math. That's the that's, thing. That's it's hard to get a big number even with the big debt because you're multiplying it by something yeah. relatively small. So you would have, so some kind of fiscal crisis would be saying, no way, they're not lending to the United States at low rates anymore. They're charging 10% because they don't believe they're going to get repaid or something like that. Yeah, that again, is to me again, a political crisis because we to get into that situation has to be really bad political decisions, but so not that, these. But not, that also is, yeah. so that isolates the, the risk factors, right? One is that you, you do get subpar economic growth, right? mm-hmm. which who knows? Obviously, growth rates have been declining gradually, I think, over the past few decades. The other one is that interest rates are, are more sensitive to, uh, to that run-up than we in, think. In, in debt than, than, we, we, than think. we think. Yeah. And, you know, the, the CBO forecasts obviously have been off by quite a bit. They've been too high. <laughs> they do I. But, you know, like once, if we have no idea how to forecast right. them, that's, that's no, a that's real right. risk factor. That's, right. that's totally right. And you, can, you right. can tell plausible stories about interest rates going up as you accumulate more debt, right? Because it, Absolutely. And I do think that, that the higher your debt, the higher your risk factor for saying, look, we're not really good at forecasting interest rates, you know. But if you go look at the interest, I was looking at this last night, interest rates minus GDP. And the, height, the biggest number we saw, I saw were, was in the 90s was 2%. Over long periods of history, we know it's basically been zero or negative, like very long. But so it could be, you know, 2% is, that was like for 10 years uh, of I minus G. And so maybe that's a risk factor. And yeah, if we're wrong and interest is really high and we have all this debt, that's costly. So, yeah, so again, I, I think what that, that's, that's all, all understood. But what, what it ignores is that the primary deficit is actually not stable. It's actually increasing. It's projected to increase. That's right, and that's in those calculations. What I'm saying, I'm not ignoring that. I'm no, no, at- I, I, I'm saying, in terms of our model, yeah. the CBO projects current law, which is not a good projection. Well, it's hard to know what a long thirty-year mm-hmm. projection is. You know, when you're projecting, current law is not. It's not going to persist. Which way? It's not. Um, can we talk about healthcare costs a little bit? Can I? <laughs> I was going to ask you. So you, I know, yeah. I don't know if you guys saw it. She, so. she slipped me a note. <laughs> so no. healthcare, obviously a large increasing share of our federal spending. Um, but you think that that's good. Yes, I do. Yeah. Well, I think, I understand that this, it's not good from a tax, you know, we, we pay for a lot of healthcare. We're getting older. That is going to be more, a larger share of the health care bill. We've expanded insurance coverage. That's a larger share of the health bill. Um, and health care spending rises more quickly than GDP. And so I was really responding to something I saw in the slides, which is this Baumol's cost disease. So one theory of health care costs is the reason health care is expensive is there's no productivity increases in health care, right? And there, but you still have to keep paying higher wages because the rest of the economy is having um, productivity increases. That's called Baumol's Baum- cost disease. And the classic example of that is like a, a, a you know, quartet, a string quartet, where there's no productivity increases. It's the same violin and the same. And, but you can't just pay them what you used to, used to pay them in, you know, 1800s. And so listening to live music gets more and more expensive over time. Healthcare is nothing like that. Healthcare is extremely technologically complex, changing, and has had huge productivity improvements. Um, and so the problem with healthcare is it's true if you look at the official data that prices of healthcare have gone up much faster than prices of other stuff. But any kind of quality adjustment where you look at outcomes finds that healthcare prices have actually fallen, fallen relative to other prices. We have just chosen to consume more of healthcare. And so there's a question of whether or not we should continue making that choice, whether or not we'll still want to make that choice, whether or not government's going to have to come in and say, no, 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 we're not going to, you know, I think there's a question. And I think clearly anything is going to have to address healthcare spending. I don't disagree with that. But I don't say, I don't think that it's kind of inevitable that healthcare spending is going to increase because of the basic underlying technology of it. It might be true for like nursing home care and home care that is very labor intensive. So even there, my guess is there's going to be a lot of uh, there's going to be robots and there's going to be I mean, there's going to be a lot of stuff. <laughs> Does that, that make think... you less concerned, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, basically I disagree with it. Number one, if you look at the data, the productivity in the healthcare sector is much lower than in the rest of the economy. Uh, so I actually disagree on that point, and that's what we model. Um, also, I mean, the, the uh, you know the the substitution of technology of capital for labor in is much, much lower in healthcare than it is in the rest of the economy. So, you know, um, certainly it is possible that you could have some real contributions of 
AI and other technology to, to bring the cost of healthcare down. But we haven't seen it. It's sort of a hope as opposed to, a, I think, a realistic uh, ex expectation, particularly given, and you know, my, my colleague uh, Jim Procreta has written about this, is given the incentives in, the, in, the, in healthcare, uh, you know, with the government being a major payer, but even the private sector, they really, the way it's set up, the way healthcare is paid for, there really aren't great incentives for uh, the application of technology. Very good. Let's take uh, one or two questions from the room. Uh, let's go over there on the right. Please wait for the mic. Say your name and say your question. Uh, J.P. Hogan. I'm hearing this and I'm wondering if there's another language and if the politics is shifting to people becoming taxable, they are also are being seen as having a debt burden. And it's like you're mortg mortgaging your future. Each citizen should assume for 30 years they have to pay their part, but it'll be a 181% debt. So is it is is there... A, I'm just wondering on the language, is there another way to talk about it as if the politics is shifting to the government wants to see the citizens has a debt obligation that for 50 years, 30 years, they're supposed to pay that as well as whatever the taxes. Is there a politics in this? So I think that sort of is the, the way I, to think about it, which is that they're going to be the primary, you know, you're going to have to sort of pay for whatever it is that you're spending plus you're going to have to pay for the fact that we allowed this big debt to accumulate. That was what my calculation was. How much are we going to have to pay for allowing this debt to accumulate? That's the sort of half a percent of GDP. So, but yeah, that's what we're doing. That's another way of saying we're mortgaging, and that's what I'm saying, we're, we're, the future is poor. We're leaving our children with this debt, so we're making ourselves better off at their, at their expense. Debt is, at its heart, a question of intergenerational equity. Right, that's what you're trading off between. Time. Of course, one way to pay for it is to borrow more and try to keep rolling over the. Yeah, maybe, maybe I didn't fully understand your question, but you know, on, on the point though of, of what the tax burden is, I mean, the way the one reason why I did the analysis as I presented it, looking at the trends and historical is, I mean, in the United States, and you look over very long periods of time, sir, there's there's some movement up and down in terms of uh, taxes as tax revenues as a share of GDP, but it's actually pretty. Pretty straight. So that seems to be that in the both. Since both World War II. Of, yeah. yeah, it's basically about 17, 17 and a half percent of GDP. So, um, you know, Democrats, Republicans, you know, recessions, uh, it seems to be that's what the, the traffic will bear. And so that I think is another aspect of why this is a more serious problem than I, I think I, I disagree with Louise. To, to go to your point on, on language, some of the libertarians like to refer to uh, deficits as delayed taxation. That's the I think that's the lingo they like. Uh, I think we, we, we have time for, for one more question all the way in the back. Hi, I'm Mara. I'm a student here in DC. Um, and you mentioned, you mentioned that um, the future generations might perhaps be wealthier, but wouldn't the massive billion dollar deficit and national debt that we have in the United States make the next generation poorer, especially to inflation as the value of the dollar diminishes and goods become more expensive? So what I was trying to calculate was how much worse off are they, are they because of the higher debt? And if you do a calculation that says if productivity increases, so that's why we think future generations are better off, just because technology tends to increase income year after year. And it's slowed down a little, but it's still 1.5% uh, per year. So if you take that into account, and then you say, oh, but we're leaving them this huge debt, they're still much better off. They're just not quite as much better off as they would have been had we not accumulated this debt. And inflation is actually very good for that. That is the risk, right? Which is that one way of paying off the debt is just because it's fixed in, most of it is fixed in nominal terms. One way of paying off the debt is just having some inflation. That's the political risk. Um, but as we were talking about before, like, you know, I think people, we used to really worry about that. Political risk is that, you know, Congress, Congress will just want the Fed to not pay attention to inflation. And I think one thing we've learned this episode is that people hate inflation. And so that's like not a smart move for Congress to do to say, oh, Fed just inflated away. That's that people would rather have a lot higher debt than the inflation. Well, there you go. I think I'm, I, I agree with that assessment. It's interesting because we were talking earlier, right, there's this assumption among economists that what the, what the politicians really want to do is crank up inflation. Uh, because they're worried about unemployment. I don't know. I don't know that that's a reasonable <laughs> assumption. Anyway, we're going to take a, 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 a short break, and then uh, Jim Capetta will be back here with Congressman Arrington. Uh, thank you all for coming, and um, I don't know.
you're going to have to wait for a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and go into the second part of our program. Um, if you could all have your seats and we can get uh, to the, the headline of our event today, which we're very pleased to, to have. Uh, let me begin by saying my name is Jim Capretta. Uh, I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute, and I am pleased to be able to welcome Congressman Jody Arrington to AEI. Graciously agreed to participate in this discussion about a potential fiscal commission. Uh, Congressman Arrington is the right person to help us understand the state of play because he serves as chairman of the House Budget Committee, uh, which recently approved legislation to stand up a commission with the objective of developing and advancing through Congress a debt stabilization plan. Congressman Arrington has been uh, immersed in serving the country through public service for more than two decades. Uh, in November 2016, he was elected to represent the 19th Congressional District in Texas, covering the areas around Lubbock and Abilene. He is only the fifth person, I was amazed to see, since 1935 to represent the residents of this part of Texas. In January 2023, just over a year ago, he became chairman of the, of the committee. Uh, he has made it and said it publicly. He wants to make budgetary decision-making a primary and expected obligation of Congress which has kind of a little bit of dis disrepair in recent years. Uh, he's, there's obviously a lot of obstacles in the way. Uh, he also serves on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, which has jurisdiction over many of the crucial aspects of this current fiscal dilemma. 
Previously, he was appointed by then Speaker Paul Ryan as the only freshman member to serve on the bicameral bipartisan Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Reform. One might also call it a commission. Um, earlier in his career, he worked for Governor George Bush, uh, which I did myself in the Bush administration. He worked in the state government and then in the Bush administration as chief of staff at FDIC. He also later served as vice chancellor at Texas Tech University, where he seems to have been a previous and very proud graduate with two degrees. Uh, Congressman Arrington, welcome to AI. Thank you for being here. Um, I have some questions, a lot of questions, uh, but I wanted to give you a minute to just to sort of introduce where, how you see things shaping up. This is a kind of an issue that's really ripened recently, and um, you know, where do you see things going, and how do you, how do you see this issue? Well, after eight town halls last week, I've gotten really good at filibustering, so I'm going to be very, very quick here. Yeah. First to say, good for you all for caring about the rapid decline of the fiscal health of the greatest nation in human history and the implications of that on the American enterprise. The fact is, uh, even Chairman Jerome Powell says that this path that we're on is unsustainable. Generally, our monetary policy friends don't opine on fiscal policy, and I think he was reluctant to do so, but he came out to say essentially it's unsustainable and it's an urgent matter. And I would submit to you, if we don't intervene and change course from this explosion in deficit spending, and again, this now the highest levels of indebtedness in the history of our country, surpassing that of America when we were fighting Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany and were in relative peace and prosperity, then we will jeopardize not only our future economic strength, but our security and America's leadership in the world and my children and your children's future in this great nation of ours. So I think it's the biggest question slash issue for us uh, to work through together in terms of America's threat in, the, in, the, in this 21st century, maintaining our global leadership, providing, as you say, on that bench out there where we parked, I hope not illegally, uh, how we secure the blessings of liberty and provide a land of opportunity for the next generation of Americans. The verdict is not, uh, is, is not out yet uh, on that question. And a lot of it, I think, revolves around fiscal matters. Well, that's a great introduction to... Um, Other than that, how y'all doing? Yeah, out yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, you're, you're, you're <laughs> speaking to people, a lot of people in the room, I think, will very much agree with the, the, premise. the urgency and the premise. And the question then is, how do we move forward? That's right. And so this idea has been percolating along now for a fiscal commission, uh, which, of course, hey, you know, it's not the first time that this has been tried, and, and I'm not even saying... Um, that the, the previous efforts didn't produce some good things, actually, because you know, a lot of people say that previous efforts didn't do anything well. They may have done some things in terms of changing the conversation. Some of the policies got enacted through potentially not the process they envisioned, but just after the fact through regular legislation. But having said that, uh, I was wondering if you could just talk for a minute about the basic case for doing a commission. In other mm -hmm. words, you know, the, the congressional process has gone into serious disrepair, right? Yes. As you know uh, very personally, running the committee there, um, that, you know, just handling basic fiscal questions, having a budget, thinking about how to, you know, manage this process, both parties giving a little and figuring out how to do it together. Uh, that process has really broken down over the last quarter century. Uh, so it's not recent even. It's That's been right. a long period of time. Um, what can a fiscal commission kind of be a substitute? Congress has yeah. returned to that kind of process in the past in various ways when there's been big questions before. It's not just in budgetary things, but other matters, government reform, trade, other things there have been commissions. What's the case, do you think, for this moment for uh, uh, another attempt at a fiscal commission? I, I think everything you said leading up to the question about the dysfunction of Congress as an institution and the broken budget process couldn't be more true. So let's just start with, do we really think an answer to this question of America's 120 trillion conservative estimate of unfunded liabilities out 30 years will be addressed by the United States Congress? 
by either party, either chamber. I can tell you what, what, uh, what Fitch, how they responded in their downgrade and how Moody's responded in their outlook downgrade. They said, we don't have a lot of confidence that this institution will work together on a realistic medium to long-term fiscal plan. Look, just getting one-third of one year's discretionary budget, budget seems impossible right now. And, 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 and getting a partisan budget resolution, just a partisan budget resolution, that says, here's our framework, our blueprint for putting our country on a path to balance. I mean, that was the first thing I was committed to as chairman of the United States House Budget Committee, not the Republican Budget Committee, is to say, we've got to go back we have to return to regular order, and we have to do these things that were required in the law and the Congressional Budget Act. And so we were able to pass that budget resolution, whether you agreed, disagreed, liked it, didn't like it. It's been over five years since uh, any committee has passed in any year, most recently, a budget resolution. So just getting these simple... Um, objectives achieved in the budget process that's well articulated by the Congressional Budget Act, uh, I have very little confidence that, that business as usual will, uh, will uh, give us any outcome that will meet the, meet the, the moment. I, I think past commissions, I'm skeptical as well, just so you know. I've done a, my fair share of research in, into this so that we could develop and learn from past uh, failures and develop some best practices and lessons learned and make, make that part of the wiring and the, uh, and the features of this commission. I think, the, I think so one thing is we're learning from the Simpson Bowles, the Greenspan Commission, et cetera, and the biggest piece of that is how do we prevent it being torpedoed for political purposes by the leadership of either chamber or the White House? Because quite frankly, the last super committee I was a part of, because Paul Ryan put me on as a freshman, and I was taking lots of notes mentally about just how these things work. And you know, I, listen, I know both sides have contributed to this mess, so forgive me when I make partisan statements, but Chuck Schumer pulled the plug on it in the 11th hour. We had the House Democrats vote present, and the Senate Democrats basically went with their party leadership. But I'm sure the Republicans have done the same thing, and maybe they did that during the Joint Select Commission on Reducing Deficits, where Jeb Henserling was one of the co-chairs. So, but either, either way, and either party being the culprit, it's too easy to kill it before it ever sees the light of day at the, on the floor of the House and Senate for an up or down vote. So that is a central change, Jim, so that this process will yield the best probability of success. I think if we can get it to a floor and have a balanced approach, have a consensus strategy on, on our long-term uh, fiscal health, I think we can get it passed. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I agree with you that in a certain way, the situation is so, in a sense, uh, stressed at the moment that a little bit, why not try a commission, you know, given uh, the probability of regular order producing yeah. something. So I, I think you're right to say that, you know, it's not, it's not crazy to think this is better than just sort of betting on the current process. And by the way, Jim, I think in the past, the problem has been that deficit spending doesn't hurt. No one gets hurt in deficit spending. I don't take any more money out of your pocket to pay for the uh, ever-growing government, the people's government. I don't cut a program that may be a favorite program of my farmers or seniors. So nobody gets hurt. And as long as that debt clock keeps ticking and nobody feels any pain or consequence, it's like, where's the sense of urgency that something needs to be done? Well, I will tell you, for whatever reason, maybe it's because we hit milestones like $34 trillion, uh, or the 120 plus percent debt to GDP higher than World War II. Maybe it's because this year they're projecting a trillion dollars in interest payments, which is bigger than, than, we, than the amount we spend on all of national defense. Maybe it's because of this unbridled spending that has produced 
a cost of living crisis for people in my district and every working family in every district in this country, and maybe they're connecting the dots, that the fiscal policies and monetary policies of this place they call Washington, D.C., supposed to be the people's capital, is, is not working, and it's impacting their pocketbooks and their cost of living and their quality of life. So I think the stage is set in a, in a much more meaningful way with a greater sense of urgency and engagement by the American people. That's just one more thing I wanted to add. No, that's good. That's good. I want to get to the objective, which yep. I, found, I found very interesting in the draft, which I've gone through, of, of what you, your committee uh, supported, um, which is different and notably different from uh, sort of the perspective of previous balanced budget efforts and so on. Uh, and just want to get your perspective on it a little bit, which is that the target, the objective of the endeavor of this commission is to stabilize debt in 2039, which is 15 years out, basically, which, um, you know, maybe a lot of Americans might think, oh, you know, that's just kicking the can. But actually, I view that as the right approach, right, to kind of, you know, the problem isn't necessarily how much we got to borrow in 2025. It's doing it every year for the next 30, 40 years. That's right. So uh, how do you explain that to your constituents? Is that something that, that in Congress is starting to be understood as the right way to think about this question? I think 10-year balanced budgets have been the sort of mental framework that we've communicated politically to constituents and we've had this conversation. Um, it's, I think, uh, a bit aggressive and maybe even overly aspirational to think we can balance uh, our budget in 10 years, although we have a balanced budget that I passed out of committee that I still think is illustrative of the things that have to be done. Do I think we were going to get any of it done in that first year? Well, no, we didn't have the Senate. We have entitlement reform. We have other things that would be very difficult. So I think debt to GDP is the best metric uh, to include growth. I think, uh, I think we overlook the growth implication on our nation's fiscal health. We didn't get here overnight. It's not popular to say this in my district or anywhere on any issue that is of import, but we will have to just be consistently spending less, growing our economy, and reforming the mandatory spending programs and entitlements that are driving the debt. And if we do that with just a little bit of bipartisan statesmanship and political will, uh, and we do it consistently, we can save the country. I want to talk about the politics in a minute because I know <laughs> you're, the, you're the expert on that one. So, uh, but let me, before we get to that, I want to, I want to ask one more about sort of targets and timing. Um, this, the draft that, that uh, is being worked on currently has these two dates that might be when they would report, one being right after the election in November, and then if the commission members agree and that they need more time, they could postpone it to May of 2025. How do you think about the timing of this and the, and the political process? I mean, Well, I think that as you get closer to November, people don't get more courage to do the right thing for the country. <laughs> That's one commentary <laughs> about the political dynamic. I, I do think, uh, this would be another little sidebar comment, Democrats probably would like to point to something that they can show that they're being fiscally responsible after 11 trillion in spending, six of which has gone to the, to the national debt over just the last few years. Now, both parties have contributed to, the, to this indebtedness in this unsustainable path. Republicans have been reckless and irresponsible, and I can, I can enumerate if we had time. The point is, we, we've both been here. Uh, we both contributed to us being here. We're both gonna have to work to get out of it. The, the Republicans, on the other hand, will be asked, just like you'll ask me, what are you gonna do about Social Security? What are you gonna do about Medicare? You keep call, saying entitlement reform. Well, I'd like to be able to say in my balanced budget that's an illustrative blueprint for saving the country. You've got growth. You've got unfunded liabilities and mandatory spending. You've got right-sizing the size of the federal government on the discretionary side. You've got program integrity measures to battle the $235 billion in improper payments, improper payments this year. But when it comes to Social Security and Medicare, 
which by the way is 98% of the 120 trillion unfunded 30 year liability, there are a lot of folks that depend on it. And it's a very sensitive topic. And no party, including the Democrats most recently who ran the table and, and they, they talk like they've got big plans to save it. They didn't do it. They passed the IRA. We went further into debt, but they didn't do it. And Republicans who talk big about cutting spending and reforming entitlements, we passed tax cuts. That's easy. That's fun. We didn't do any real meaningful spending reforms. And we talk big about saving Social Security and Medicare and addressing the insolvency and unsustainability. Both parties, if you, it, listen, if Congress worked and both parties lived up to their rhetoric, we wouldn't need a commission. But um, my folks in West Texas aren't fools, and most people throughout this country are not as naive and, and ignorant and simple as Washington thinks they are. We have to cut through the BS, the political weaponization of these things, and get serious lawmakers like Scott Peters and Jimmy Panetta and Bill Huizinga and, 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 and others, Joe Manchin, in a room at the table doing what's best for the country. Probably the outcome will be that no party likes it, but enough of us will vote for it to save the country. That's what I think has to happen. That's excellent because now that was just leading right into my question, which is, which is that you know, some, every once in a while a vote will come down the down the down the road in Congress, it's sort of a career-defining vote that yeah. people vote yes or no, and uh, their constituents hold them accountable one way or the other. Maybe they like it, maybe they don't like it. Um, and this kind of a vote on something this big would certainly be that. Yes. Um, and you know, to get the Democratic Party invested and interested, I think you know some of the pain they they would extract from the other their their yeah. friends on the other side of the aisle. Uh, which is mainly a tax increase, right? Um, do you sense that people on your side of the aisle are ready to think about that? Are they even, is it something that they understand is a possibility? Not only that, my view would be a likelihood if yeah. this were to actually happen. How do you, how do you, how do you digest that in the yeah, political process? It's, it's not easy um, because my Democrat colleagues who are supportive of this commission idea this model to sort of turn down the politicization of, of all of this, um, they're getting hit by groups who are saying this is a backdoor way to cut Social Security and Medicare. I feel very badly when I read the headlines, shame, shame on these guys. Yeah. Um, Social Security and Medicare both, the trust funds are insolvent in this 10-year window. And for, for example, Social Security beneficiaries, and you know this, will take an almost 25% cut automatic if politicians do what they do best, which is do nothing. So I so respect those folks who are stepping up, my Democrat colleagues, and taking the slings and arrows from that end. And then you've got folks on the uh, outside, mainly Republican groups, raise no taxes ever groups, don't ever say the word tax groups. Nobody, no Republican I know came to Washington to raise taxes, but they're, <laughs> but they're saying this is a backdoor way to raise taxes. The, the fact is, uh, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, if there was any model, there was a Greenspan commission that sort of teed up the considerations for saving Social Security then. It wasn't a straight program reform or list of programmatic reforms, and it wasn't a straight revenue or list of pay-fors. It was a combination, and Ronald Reagan, God bless him, was willing to do what he knew was right because, let's face it, and I'm going to say it one more time, when Republicans had run of the show with President Trump, I was a freshman, and we had the House and Senate, what did we do about this issue that we talked so much about, more than the Democrats? Nothing. And what did they do except make things worse? The deficit grew. And the debt got worse. Same thing with the Democrats. So it just seems to stand to reason that we come together and not wait until there's a crisis when, by the way, whatever the measures are, programmatic reforms or pay-fors in, e in either of the big programs or anything, it's going to get worse. You don't govern well. You don't make good, I don't think, responsible decisions in that environment. So I, I, I understand the sensitivities. Obviously, I come at this as a spending problem, not a tax problem. But at the end of the day, 
Uh, it's a $2 trillion deferred tax on my three children problem at the end of the day. And your children and grandchildren. That's what it is at the end of the day. And it isn't courageous to pass tax cuts and to leave my children paying more of the, of the tab. And it's not courageous to grow the government and say we're promising, because both are popular, promising another chicken and another pot and a car and another driveway <laughs> without paying for it. We don't pay for stuff. It's that simple. So let's get around the table. Let's figure out how we're going to pay for the government we're promising that we think the American people need and want so that our children don't inherit the daggum whirlwind of our, our recklessness. Very good. Um, that, part of that uh, background in terms of the, the difficulty is playing out, of course, in a, in a big way on the national stage as the candidates vie for the White House again. Yes. And uh, maybe I'll put it this way. I think there, there are... You're going to um, get me into some real trouble. No, I, I hope not. I hope not. No, you're, you're not. You're pretty good at... Uh, at finding your way through this. But, um, you know, look, there are three candidates left from the two major parties. There are a lot of people out there saying they yes. want to be president, but from the two major parties, there's sort of three standing still. You know, one's a long shot, and she happens to be sort of saying, you know, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Yes. Uh, the leading candidates, uh, the, one we, the one we know who's going to be the Democrat, the, the incumbent, and then his challenger, um, may, you know, likely challenger, they seem much less interested, and you had a lot of direct experience with that, as you were saying, yeah. when you were a freshman in, in your first few, few years. I mean, if, if President Trump returns to the White House, I don't see a lot of evidence that he's going to change tack, tack and, 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 yeah. and make this a priority again. So it might be left to people like yourself and others in Congress yeah. to f push it forward, regardless of what the executive branch says. We have yeah. separately elected people for a reason in this That's country. Right. How do you see that dynamic? And is that something that, is the party changing? Is it becoming less fiscally conservative because of, of President Trump? I don't know if it's, I don't think it was, I think the Republican Party losing its commitment to fiscal responsibility preceded President Trump. I think that's probably right. Um, what I think President Trump has that no other person in political leadership or certainly some viable candidate for the presidency, in my opinion, is political courage to do things that are very unpopular when he chooses to do them. Um, and I would say that what this is a massive political lift and it is extremely sensitive and it will require courage from all involved. Um, it would help to have someone in the White House lead the charge. Um, I appreciate and understand the, that when both leading contenders for the White House from both parties say, we're not going to touch Social Security or Medicare, that I get it politically, but that means that in eight years, beneficiaries are going to get a automatic cut. I think a big part of this commission that I'm excited about, um, when you say, well, how do you measure success? A big part of this is a national campaign to educate and raise the awareness of this issue, Jim, that I don't think has been top of mind and has stirred in the hearts of our countrymen like it should. I already told, we already know why. I mean, it's just, we're not feeling the hit, we're, doing, we're feeling a little bit of it now, the sting, but that clock keeps ticking and people just were sort of sleepwalking off the fiscal cliff. So I, uh, I, I think as President Abraham Lincoln said, you know, with public sentiment, you can do anything, but without it, you can do nothing. So if we wanna put pressure appropriately on political leaders, as they run for office, and whether it's at the top of the ticket or in congressional seats across this land, then let's have the kitchen conversation. Let's have the conversation in living rooms across America be, what are we going to do to save our children's future from a sovereign debt crisis that is an inevitability and will be not only catastrophic, 
catastrophic, but irreparable if we don't do it. Now, tell me candidates in congressional seat X, Y, or Z, what's your plan? Tell me, president of the Democrat party, what's your plan? Republican party, that's not happening. So at a, at, at, at a minimum, we can change that discourse. We can up the ante there. And I, I think that's an imperative. Look, the reason I'm excited about President Trump is that number one, when it came to USMCA, when it came to uh, DACA, which was a third rail for Republicans in immigration, he said, I'll do it. I'll do a deal. Y'all want to do a deal? I won't even just, I won't only put DACA uh, recipients on the table, which was like 700,000. I'll go all the way and say anyone that was DACA eligible will give them a path to sort of legal, uh, some legal status in this country. No one had ever done that. I mean, it was completely outside of classical, conservative, Republican, orthodoxy. This, I think President Trump is actually very practical, but I think he is very strong-willed, and we're going to need that. So if one were to embrace our plan what, or the consensus that comes out of it and, and get behind it and put their full force of their bully pulpit and their influence, I think that President Trump has the greatest potential to do it, is what I would tell you. Very good. I think there will be... A, you made a good case. I'm not sure... That's just my, one yeah. man's opinion. One man's opinion, yeah. Um, okay, uh, for the audience... Uh, get, we don't have time for questions from the audience, do we? Yeah. Do we, do we? <laughs> Can we skip? No. You're going to... Just a couple. How's no, that? I don't... I, I'll take as many... I, yeah, I don't yeah, have yeah. all the answers. Let me... Maybe uh, there are some uh, solutions out there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I get one more, and then, okay. we, and then go we'll, go, we'll go to that. Okay. Uh, so, audience, uh, get ready for questions. Um, this is a little bit out of, out of, out of the, the flow here, but I mean, this commission is going to be affecting discretionary spending and, you know, potentially, you know, they're, they're, they're things that they can look at are, are wide and varied. And so uh, how, does, how do you see um, national security questions fitting into this? I mean, uh, I'm not a national security person, but I mean, anyone can see there's a lot of yeah. uh, issues percolating right now. And it doesn't seem like a great time to be cutting defense. No. But um, how do you see discretionary and those kinds of questions fitting into the larger picture? I think that's one of the problems. We talked about the dysfunction, the broken process with respect to Congress and why we have little hope anyone, surely, has any hope that left to its normal devices and processes, this won't happen. The other piece of it is we tend to, hyperventilate about the one-third of the of next year's budget and never really look at the longer term. What that's done has probably done uh, as much damage as good in various attempts to cap discretionary, to cut discretionary. I'm of the opinion that after COVID, where we had a 40% growth in government spending, about 30% on the discretionary, or according to CBO, literally over $300 billion more than they projected we'd be spending today uh, when mm -hmm. they projected it prior to COVID. Right. I think the government is too big, no surprise. I think it's bloated, and there's a lot of waste to go after. But let's be clear. We could cut all of discretionary, the entire discretionary budget, and we won't stave off, in my opinion, the, the big uh, event of undermining our uh, reserve currency. And that, that, that's the big one. There's a lot of ways to have a debt crisis undermining the dollars of reserve currency in a sovereign debt crisis would be, would be the big one. Or as Paul Ryan put it, termites at your front porch or the bear at the front door, they're both bad. Um, one, one happens uh, w more immediately. <laughs> so, so if you look at GDP, if you look at experience, what we invest in defense per GDP or per capita, we're clearly at decades low. And we're about to go under 3% for the first time uh, GDP in a, in, in, in a long time. I mean, pre-World War II. It's hurting. Debt is crowding out not only capital that could help us get out of the doldrums economically and avoid a recession or, or a sustained stagnant economy, so it doesn't just rob capital 
that could go to work for a greater tomorrow economically, it squeezes our priorities in infrastructure, in defense, and other what I would say are federal priorities. So um, I think talking about the two-thirds of the budget, which is mandatory spending, you all know that, but it's also 90% of the growth in our budget over the next yeah. decade. By the way, as you know, the 20 plus trillion that CBO says will add to the debt over the next 10 years, half of that is interest. So yes, let's be responsible. Yes, there's waste at the Pentagon, for heaven's sakes. And let's do those things that we need to do to get our fiscal house in order on the discretionary side. But if we were trying to solve a problem in our business, we wouldn't look at that one third of one year. We'd look at what the 90% growth is, and that's where we'd spend our time, or we would be out of business. And these guys would be off the payroll, and we wouldn't be creating value for our customer. And that's insane to me. Insane to me. But it's uh, so defense is obviously critical, it's mission critical, it's, 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 it's part of the mission to provide a common defense. And you're right. The world is not less dangerous. Things are not less complicated. Things are not less uh, or not more stable. They're less stable. Um, and the threats uh, abound. And we need to be prepared for those. If we do anything right and well, uh, we've got to provide for the common defense. The rest we can, you know, I think we can debate. Yeah. Okay, open to questions. Do we have any out there in the audience? Uh, let me, uh, I th saw this hand first, and then uh, this one, and, and then we'll go here. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Grant. So I'm, a, um, I'm an intern at the Cato Institute, and it seems to me like, especially the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, would like to solve the problems you described today by raising the cap and the payroll tax, and they say we'll solve everything. We yeah. can't even raise Social Security benefits. Yeah. Um, given where I'm employed at, I'm sure I and you don't agree with that ideologically, but how would you make the case to the American people that, that we shouldn't do that? Because a lot of Americans would see that as we're just raising taxes on the wealthy. Why can't we do that? Well, I just think taxes is raising taxes right now is a horrible idea. I do think we've gone, I think it's a scope and scale of the government and there's an associated cost. Uh, but there, there were promises made. By the way, Republicans expanded Part D of Medicare, one element. We didn't pay for Medicare when we created it, unlike Social Security, which was set up to pay for itself. And then we expanded it, and we took a lot of political credit, but we didn't pay for it. So um, again, I'm trying to be fair to criticize both sides. We are teetering on, I think, a recession, if not a sustained, stagnant economy. Um, we have a cost of living crisis, and all you have to do is get out of this town to know that we have one uh, for working people in this country. And taxes, even the Tax Policy Institute, which is a left-leaning group, says that 70% of taxes, or a big chunk of them, will be passed through to consumers. Now, is that something we want to do right now? Do we want to make our economy less competitive? Uh, quite frankly, the bipartisan tax package that we just passed out of the House, which is getting criticism on both sides, I can't believe the Wall Street Journal's going after uh, this so, so uh, fervently. We basically take the biggest pro-growth tax measures, business expensing, uh, interest expensing, R&D, and we give it another year till we can get to 25. We have to have some supply side relief to address the imbalance between supply and demand. If all we have is the hammer of higher interest, God help us. It's not going to work out well for anybody, for the country, macro e uh, economy, or for our fellow Americans, it will not go well. So I'm glad we found, uh, I think, a good compromise there. I'm not a big fan of, of uh, refundable tax credits. I think we, I think, I'll just say I'm not a big fan of refundable tax credits. But this would be a horrible idea today. And by the way, um, I've seen all the various tax hikes added up together, um, and you, it's just like discretionary budget and cutting all discretionary. You can't balance that way. You cannot save the country from a debt crisis. We're already in a vicious cycle. 
that will just accelerate that vicious cycle to a point where uh, the interest are too high, inflation's high, um, unemployment's going to start going up as we as the economy recedes, and our, our children will inherit a very bad economy for a very long time. And when we reduced the tax base for businesses and for individuals, we did see record investment. We did see, in fact, we saw record po uh, low poverty levels because all boats rose on the tide of prosperity. We we tax raising taxes. I think now. We have a 75,000 page tax code. Do you think there are any special interests in that tax code? Do you think there are any special interests that could be repealed to broaden the base? Do you think there's some loopholes that could be closed to broaden the base? And then we could talk about equity, and I have my opinion of equity. If 1% pay 40% of the taxes, if 15% of Americans are paying 75% of the freight for this great country of ours, and too many people have no sense of ownership in this, in our future, that's a bad, that is a, Ben Franklin said it. He said when the people realize they can vote for themselves money without any real consequence for paying for it, basically, that will be the end of the republic. And we are just, we are so dangerously close, we don't even know it. But... I appreciate it. We have to put everything on the table. There are ways to look at the tax code for competitiveness, for equity, for, uh, for, for loopholes, and, and, and the like, uh, and, and, and uh, without saying we're going to jack up the tax rates on, you know, fill in the blank. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, gentleman here. Uh, Wendell Primus uh, with the Brookings Institution. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I totally agree that we need to do reduce the deficit. I would say a better model is what a Republican president did uh, in 1990, and when you had the money committees, appropriations, budget, and ways and means, House and Senate leadership got together and did 500 billion of deficit reduction. I would also argue you need both taxes and spending, and you need to increase the legal immigration limit given the fertility rate. Please comment on that way of doing budget as opposed to the deficit. Commission. Well, I think that's a reasonable, uh, uh, very business-minded and practical approach. And I think that's what this commission lends itself to, getting the right people, having a lower threshold to get it out of this commission, which is a simple majority and only two from each party, and then it gets expedited consideration. But uh, once we start precluding various things or mandating certain strategies, it, it all starts to fall apart. Um, yeah, we have a labor uh, shortage issue that is affecting our productivity and our economic growth. We have to address it. I'd like to say uh, it's not just immigration. There's a better and smarter way to have a win-win for a, a nation of immigrants um, that, that has always been blessed by the new blood of the immigrant that was ready to work, ready to, uh, to sacrifice uh, for, for their families and the love of their new country. Man, that's America, right? It's hard to, when you say that even now, right, in the context of everything going on, I'm always saying in, the, in God's country back home in West Texas, I welcome the God-fearing, freedom-loving immigrant that wants to make America their new home. I just want everyone, including the immigrant, to respect our laws, our sovereignty, and the safety of our citizens. That's it. But yeah, that's part of it. But the other part is, how about we put real work requirements instead of this window dressing BS on work-capable adults? Because we have a, in my humble opinion, we have an entitlement slash welfare culture, and it is a disservice to the people that have become dependent on government. The ones that can't work, or the ones that are working hard and still struggling, now I may debate how best to meet those needs, I certainly wouldn't create a program at USDA or other places in this federal government and have a one size fits all, but I do think the safety net, if done responsibly, can be of benefit. But we ought to start with Americans who aren't working because our policies encourage them not to work 
And that's a big part. In fact, the last few years, this unemployment insurance where we were paying people, half the people on unemployment insurance were getting paid more on this plus up unemployment insurance in the name of COVID than they were making in their previous jobs. That is a, that is a recipe for economic disaster. But you make a lot of sense, way too much sense to be a guy from Washington. You must be from Lubbock, Texas, or someplace where there's he hasn't some always normal been at, people. Let me put it this way. He hasn't always been at the Brookings Institution. <laughs> okay, yeah. I'm starting to... Uh, no, anyway, that's good, good, good. I hope I, I, hope I used to work for, for Speaker Pelosi for a long time. So. Man, are you kidding me? And I just said he had a good sense about it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. No, I think that's reasonable. That's why we have this. Public service. Public, Public service. service. Uh, we're out of time. Thank you. Let's uh, join me in thanking uh, Thank uh, you, Congressman Jim. Arrington. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you all.